October 1967, the 50th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. The march ends. Festivities begin. Festivities to conclude the largest military maneuvers in the history of the Red Army. This is the Soviet soldier's oath of service. It is considered an honor to read it, to become a full-fledged soldier. When you become a soldier and start on that long road, don't be a boy doing military duty. Be a man. Be a man. And in the Red Army, you are a man. Tough, well-trained, disciplined, highly motivated. On September 9th, 1967, the forces of the Prikorpatsky, Belaruski, and certain other military districts in preparation for the maneuvers Operation Dnieper are ordered to move. The mobilization also includes airborne landing forces and anti-aircraft defense forces of the Soviet Union. The battle will pit eastern forces against western forces. For those who move cross-country, it is necessary to move their positions at night. These powerful pieces of equipment are actually quite mobile and easy to handle. Aloft are Soviet aircraft providing cover for the ground troops as part of the field commander's forces. The alert extends into the hardened underground silos of the Soviet ICBM arsenal. With a range of three to 5,000 miles, these intercontinental ballistic missiles are capable of striking the United States. As part of the Soviet defense system against other nations' ICBMs, thousands of radar antennas stand perpetual watch. On land, on sea, in the freezing snows of the Siberian Arctic, in the torrid sands of the Turkestan Desert, the screens keep turning. A whole generation of Russians has grown up under their protective shadow. Another defensive system is the powerful strategic force, the Red Navy. The Soviet submarine fleet is the world's largest over 350 undersea craft, all of them built since the end of World War II. These are diesel-powered attack subs, quick, highly maneuverable, deadly. The Soviet Union's first atomic submarine, its name, Super Nautilus, its capability, to circumnavigate the globe without surfacing. Today, one in every seven Soviet subs is nuclear powered. A Kinder class missile cruiser. 
followed by two caution class frigates. The smaller caution is armed with surface to air missiles named GOA. The Kinder carries a particularly deadly surface to surface missile, the Shadow. Range about 400 miles. She also fires the GOA surface to air missile with a range of from 10 to 20 nautical miles. The first Soviet warship with the surface to surface missile was the Kupni class destroyer. The shape, the armament of the Soviet warship has changed radically. But a Russian saying of an earlier time still holds true. Steel, armor, sea of fire. A naval air patrol under command of the fleet commander supports the Soviet fleet. The Bear naval reconnaissance aircraft is a modified bomber. The Badger carries the deadly cruise missile, the Kennel, guided to its surface target from the aircraft. Refueling operations keep Soviet strategic bombers airborne. Giant domes on the Moss early warning aircraft extend the range of the Soviet radar system. Computers perform thousands of operations per second, spotting the target almost instantaneously and determining its exact coordinates. The Soviets have learned to use rocket boosters to aid takeoff. They have developed a swing wing aircraft, a plane as they call it, with wings of variable geometry. guided missiles reach targets as accurately as anything in the U.S. arsenal. The Soviet Union's ground-based surface-to-air missiles compare favorably with the American Nike as an anti-aircraft defense weapon. Modern Soviet submarines are now equipped to fire intercontinental ballistic missiles from below the ocean surface, designed to complement the massive land-based ICBM arsenal. The scenario is defense against an attack by the Western forces. The forces of the East approach the location of the exercise. They expect to make contact at the Dnieper River. In the command post, technicians work with electronic communication equipment as modern as any in the world. Commanding officers are in full, instantaneous contact with the forces in the field, 
down to the regimental level. Each individual fighting man is fully informed as to his duty. Thorough orientation aims to keep opportunities for confusion to a minimum. Reconnaissance aircraft join the exercise to perform functions similar to those of our recon aircraft. Forward air controllers relay the command. Fighter bombers, lift off. The latest MiG-21 provide close air support for infantry and tanks as the Western forces attack. Heavy artillery. The mobile ground-to-ground -ground frog missile. It plays a similar role to that of the Honest John rockets of the American Army. Also taking the field are mobile surface-to-air missiles, the guideline SA-2s of the U-2 and Cuba fame. Artillery rockets are launched electronically. Data is processed at the control panel. Commanding Operation Yeper is Marshal of the Soviet Union, Grochko, Minister of Defense for the USSR. Further evidence of its importance is the presence of generals of the Supreme Command of the Soviet Armed Forces and of their guests, military delegations from friendly armies. October morning, 8 o'clock. The exercise begins. A salvo of Hollinger, the M1938 122 millimeter, counterpart of the US 105 millimeter M102. Join the battle. Massive tank assault spearhead the eastern counterattack. T-62, among the most modern Soviet tanks, are equivalent to the US M-60. The older T-55 is between the American M-48 and M-60 in time of development. It can fire accurately even while on the move. Fighter jets of mixed vintage provide cover for the ground forces against hostile aircraft. The massive tank force presses on relentlessly. It is impossible, even from a helicopter, for the unaided eye to take in the whole range of the attack. The eastern forces regain lost territory. The commander of the Western Forces, Colonel General Bicharin, orders a counterattack in an effort to regain lost position.
under broad air cover, Western ground forces continue the thrust. But the forces of the East are superior. The counterattack is stopped. The Eastern counteroffensive regains its momentum. abandons the field. It will attempt its stand at the Dnieper River. The east presses ahead. The eastern command smells victory. It decides to cross the Dnieper by force. The Dnieper rises in White Russia and flows through Ukraine to the Black Sea. It plays a dominant role in Russian military history. Many key battles have been fought on its banks. Rivers make good lines of defense. The Western strategy is to stand firm all along the banks. This time, the battle will be without bloodshed. The objective is preparedness and perhaps a message to the rest of the world. In the last war, artillery fire might thunder on for hours. Today, simultaneous bombardment from rockets, guns, and aircraft can soften an opponent in minutes. The line of defense is exposed. Across the Dnieper, the command rings through the eastern ranks. To the left bank. Heavy air support covers the crossing. and armor swarm across the water. T-54 and 55 tanks, mainstays of the Soviet ground forces. The BRDM armed amphibious scout vehicles. A PT-76 light amphibious tank convoys a fleet of personnel carriers. Infantry assault forces cross in the BTR-60P armored personnel carrier. 16 men in each vehicle. Because this is a wheeled vehicle, it has no equivalent in the American arsenal. Propulsion in the water is achieved through use of hydrojets. Hound helicopters will attempt to land eastern airborne troops behind the opponent's line. As the ground forces continue their frontal attack across the river, This helicopter resembles the U.S. Army's UH-19 Chickasaw, but is appreciably larger in size and power. helicopters deliver ordnance and supplies to the paratroopers. The hook 
is twice as big as the largest free world production helicopter, carrying 61 fully equipped troops. Airborne attackers continue to hit crucial points behind the western line. The eastern crossing becomes more and more secure. It is now possible to ferry non-amphibious equipment across the river. The GSP ferrying device is made by linking together two tracked amphibians and two large metal pontoons. About to begin is one of the most fascinating moments of the whole assault. A large force of all types of eastern tanks is fitted with snorkels. It will make a mechanized crossing in force on the river's bottom. The tanks emerge on the opposite shore in full combat readiness. The time has come to consolidate the attack and to saddle the Dnieper completely. Engineers put together bridges over which the major eastern forces will cross. The basic unit of the Soviet TMT bridge is a four-section folding pontoon. The bridge is assembled along the riverbank in a matter of minutes. Power boats will turn it 90 degrees across the river. The first bridge is ready in very short order. Carrying capacity is 60 tons. Tanks can cross at speeds up to 30 kilometers per hour. Wheeled vehicles may cross at unlimited speed. The second bridge is soon in use. The Dnieper front runs for several hundred kilometers. It will be necessary to establish a number of crossing points. In 1943, when the Red Army pursued the Germans across the Dnieper, it took 14 days to build a wooden bridge. Today, the Soviets are able to place a span carrying rail and vehicular traffic simultaneously and do it in a matter of hours. The NZM-56 is unique. No other nation has a military bridge with this dual capacity. The Dnieper is far from secure. Ahead lie the marshlands between Dnieper and Pripyat, better suited for duck hunting than war. But the Red Army is equipped for such challenges and crosses it successfully. Once on solid ground, the East rolls ahead in force. Ground troops are deployed in the BTR-152, a non-amphibious armored personnel carrier. now calls for a heavy airborne attack behind the opponent's line. Soviet paratroopers are well equipped and rigorously trained. 
Their assignment is to seize nuclear attack and communication points. Their officers expect a superior performance, whether in exercises or in real battle. Soviet jumping techniques differ significantly from those used by Western airborne troops. Normal jumps are made with a stabilized parachute that provides time for the paratrooper to orient himself. Supplies are moved in quickly. Ordnance and construction materials are air landed. Other supplies will be dropped by parachute. The Soviets have developed a new rocket brake system. Retro rockets decelerate the rate of fall to near zero velocity at touchdown. Multi-dome parachutes make it possible to drop extremely heavy equipment, enough to support a complete operation if necessary. This airborne attack is a secondary action far from the main eastern assault sweeping across the Dnieper. It provides some idea of the size of the 50th anniversary exercises. follow the paratroopers. The ASU-85, a typical piece of Soviet airborne equipment, is an 85-millimeter tracked assault gun weighing 16 and a half tons. intensifies as the exercise enters its final stage. Gun. Rocket. A ground-hugging rocket device. Another overground guided missile is the spectacular Patur. This deadly anti-tank device has outstanding accuracy. Helicopters, too, are equipped with another type of guided missile for use against tanks, the swatter. Aircraft from both sides are called in to attack ground targets. never end. The superior eastern forces carried the offensive. 
but both East and West performed their roles in an outstanding manner. Neither side can claim victory. All can claim satisfaction. <laughs>